In the last part, we have related strain components to stress components by a compliance tensor. And uh, this compliance tensor has 36 components, out of which uh, 21 are independent. Why is that so? Because our compliance tensor is also symmetric. We have seen this compliance tensor in a view of an anisotropic materials. Now we will see that how the compliance tensor in a view of isotropic materials. So let's do that. Let's have this strain components. And this is our compliance tensor and this is our strain components. So we know that this compliance tensor will relate the normal strains to normal stresses, shear strains to shear stresses, normal strains to shear stresses, nor shear strains to normal stresses. This is what we have seen that there will be 99 components which are relating the strain components with stress components. So now we consider a case of an isotropic material and let's focus on these nine components which we will be finding out that normal stress or which relates normal stress to normal strains or vice versa. So we know that the elastic stress strain relationships for an isotropic materials we have figured it out that the normal strain that is epsilon 1 1 is equal to 1 upon e sigma 1 1 minus mu into sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3. We have de derived this relation when we dealt with anisotropic materials to find out a contribution of normal stresses that is sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2, sigma 3 3 towards epsilon 1 1. Now I can write this relation in another way. Let me do that. I can write this epsilon 1 1 as sigma 1 1 upon E minus mu upon E sigma 2 2 minus mu upon E sigma 3 3. So if we look at this relation here, which we would like to correlate, that is a normal strains to normal stresses, you can say that the first term must be 1 upon E. The second term should be, which is relating epsilon 1 1 to sigma 2 2, must be minus mu upon E. So that is minus mu upon E. The third term will be minus mu upon e which is relating epsilon 1 1 to sigma 3 3. So this would be minus mu upon e. This next three terms will be 0 0 0. But now let's uh, with a similar way you can say that this you can find out three terms for epsilon 2 2 and three terms from epsilon 3 3. So those will be minus mu upon e 1 upon e minus mu upon e for epsilon 2 2 and for epsilon 3 3 that will be minus mu upon e minus mu upon e 1 upon e. So this we can get these nine components using this relation. That is, that is very much straightforward. And all these six uh, remaining three components here will be 0, 0, 0. So let's mark those components. Those will be 0, 0, 0. Similarly, you can say that the relationship between gamma 2, 3 and uh, sigma 2, 3, you can find it out using this relation. That is, uh, shear strain is related to shear stress using shear modulus and that will be 1 upon g. Similarly, I can find out a relation between gamma 1 3 to sigma 1 3 as 1 upon g 1 upon g and here we invoke this principle of shear decoupling that when you, I have a shear stresses on one plane, it will not cause shear strain on another two planes. So this is for isotropic cubic materials. So we get that this these three components to be turned out to be zero. Similarly, these three components will be zero. Now, this uh, what we got is a compliance tensor which is which are relating a strain components to stress components for an isotropic uh, cubic materials. And here you can, I would like you to find out a relation between S44 in terms of S11 and S12. So let me tell you how you can do that. Let me write it down. So you know the relation G is equal to E upon 2 into 1 plus mu. Now I know, so this is, this is S44, this is S11 and this is S12. So you can find out a relation 
we can use this relation and find out this relation between S44, S11 and S12. Now let's go ahead. So we have a relation of strain to stress using a compliance tensor and we have figured it out this compliance tensor for an isotropic material and similarly we can find out a relation between stress and strain through stiffness tensor. So this stiffness tensor is, is written over here where you can see that this lambda is called as Lamis constant and lambda is equal to C12. And you can see if you compare the stiffness tensor to a compliance tensor, you can clearly see here that you can find out some relations. Let me write it down. So I have this C44 and I have, so sorry, this is C44 and I have this S44. So I can find out a relation between C44 and S44 that C44 is equal to 1 upon S44. Similarly, I would like you to find out the relation between C11 in terms of S11 and S12 and C12 in terms of S11 and S12. Here you can, I would like to introduce another term or another factor which is very necessary to find out an anisotropy for a cubic crystals that is called as a Zener ratio or anisotropy ratio. So that is given only for cubic crystal. So that is defined as AR is equal to 2C44 upon C11 minus C12. So this ratio is called as Zener ratio or anisotropy ratio. Now if the value of this anisotropy ratio or Zener ratio is equal to 1, the material is called as elastically isotropic. If value deviates from 1, you can say that it is anisotropic. So I would like to do one more thing that figure out this C44, C11 and C12 for tungsten and iron both are BCC and find out AR for these materials and see which one is elastic, elastically isotropic or not. Let's go further. So when we discussed about symmetry of a compliance tensor I have in briefly introduced what is elastically stored energy. Here in this case, this elastically stored energy, we will see that it is a work done when the body or body is deforming elastically. So you have this potentially stored energy. When I am deforming material elastically, there will be that energy which will be stored and it will be released when I remove the load. Why so? Because material is deforming elastically. So I assume a linear elasticity and let's consider this member which is hinged at one end and let's consider their dimension its dimension has to be area to be a and length to be l now this member is being subjected to a force along x direction that is uniaxial force along x direction and extends to somewhat by a length dx now under the influence or under the complete force it extends to a distance x and I can find out what is fx versus x here and you can say that the material is elastic, linearly elastically deforming. I can say that if I want to deform material to x, it, it needs a force of f. So from this we can find out what is the energy that is required to make or elongate this material elastically by, by an amount x. So you can say that dW can be written as, that is work done, the product of force that I need to have the small displacement dx. And I can figure it out what is the complete work that is needed. So I can integrate from 0 to x. And I consider that this work done would be u or w. This is, this is our potential energy or potential energy that has been stored when the uh, material is elastically deforming. Now from this I can say that what can be the amount of energy that is needed so that will be nothing but a area under this uh, force displacement curve. So I can write it as area has to be half fx and this is nothing but the potential energy that has been absorbed when the material is deformed elastically. 
So I can write this as f to be sigma into a which is nothing but stress into area and x to be length into strain. Mind you, this is for very, very small displacements and for only linear elastic materials. So I can write this term only when I consider very small displacements. Now as and there is another assumption which I consider that the displacement are solved and there is no appreciable change in area when I uh, put a strain of epsilon here or volume. There is no change in area or volume when the strain is epsilon. This I can write it as sigma into epsilon into A into L and this term A into L is nothing but a volume now and I bring it towards the left hand side and I get a term called elastic store energy per unit volume and this is nothing but the area under stress strain curve for very small displacements or very small amount of strain and I term it as U0 to be half of sigma into epsilon that is nothing but elastic stored energy per unit volume. Now I know sigma is equal to E into epsilon which is Hooke's law. I can put epsilon to be sigma upon E which in turn I will get U0 to be equal to half sigma square upon E and I can put sigma or replace sigma by E into epsilon and I can say that elastic stored energy is equal to half E epsilon square. So in actual case, we got u naught to be half sigma into epsilon. Similarly, we can find out this relation for when you have shear stresses and shear strength. And you can write that u naught to be half tau into gamma using the relation that shear stress is related to shear strength using a elastic constant uh, that is shear modulus. So I can write this similar relation for shear stress and shear strength that is that is an elastic pulse stored energy per unit volume to be half of tau into gamma. Now let's do generalization. When you have 3D stress state, we use a principle of superposition. What does that exactly mean? Is that you can write U0 to be product of normal stresses and normal strains and product of shear stresses and shear strains. So in tensor notation, you can write this as U0 equal to half of sigma ij into epsilon ij. So we can write this equation, this equation or only in terms of stress or only in terms of strength. So basically you can use this relation. Let me write it down. We have used this. So in tensorial notation we have used this. So epsilon ij is equal to sij kl into sigma kl. So you can use this relation and you can use, you can write this u0 that is a potential energy or elastically stored energy per unit volume. Only thing, only difference is that what we get it here is we are using the tensor component of the shear strain. Here we are using shear strains. What we get is here a tensor component of shear strain. So with this, I will stop here.